Good morning, fellow worshipers. <laughs> the First Christian Church, a beacon of hope in the River Valley since 1859. What a tremendous heritage we have. We're glad that you are here. I want to warn you, the next time I'm up here on the passing of the peace, it's going to be musical pews. Whenever Mary Beth stops the music, you've got to sit down where you are. <laughs> but I won't put you through that today. So all of you stand, greet someone around you, the passing of the peace. Okay, folks, see if you can corral yourself and have a seat, please. Okay, okay. This side now is very respectful. <laughs> and this side over here, you just can't control them. Okay, since you are standing over here, let's all stand for the opening hymn, page 464, God of Grace and God of Glory.
Let us turn to the back of the bulletin here to see what uh, is on tap this week. There will be a congregational meeting directly after the service today, so don't leave after the benediction. Hardy has a matter that he wants to bring up, and that is right after church today. Disciples Bell's rehearsal following that, and a, uh, an elders meeting tonight at 6.30, downstairs where the elders usually meet. So that is not in your bulletin, but that is uh, on tap for today. Disciples Men's Fellowship on Monday. Tuesday, the lunch bunch at fried rice, number two. And uh, the chancel choir at four o'clock, also on Tuesday. And Wednesday, primetime bell rehearsals. So, elders meeting coming up next Sunday, along with Disciples Bell's rehearsal. Okay, concerns and celebrations. Now, I'm a little hard of hearing, so be sure you speak up. Uh, celebrations, birthdays, anniversaries, divorces, Our prayers are for him. Thank you, Tim. Let us look in our bulletin then for the call to worship. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise, Praise him for his acts of power. Praise, Praise him for his passing grace. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with all the instruments. Beloved, if you would remain standing, good morning to you and to all of those who may be watching at home. Spirits led me this morning to do the invocation from the most sacred location on this campus that we call First Christian. This is the altar. This is the altar of God. This is the place where we first come formally to make our declaration in Christ. This is where we come formally to join the church at the altar. It's the place where we break bread together. It's the place where in just a few minutes we will bring our gifts unto the Lord. The altar is the place where we bless our babies, where we perform wedding ceremonies. It's the place we bring our loved ones who are departed, for we take them out yonder and say, earth, earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. And what makes this place so special, this sacred altar, is because God has promised to meet us here in his house. 
This is his house. We are his people. He is the host. You and I are the guest. So as we come today to pray, let's be mindful of the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we accept the invitation to enter your house and to bow before your holy presence. We bring with us our burdens and all that has weighed us down all week. Some of us are tired and weary, and a few of us are sick and afflicted. We have heard about those even in Utah, Lord, who have grown sick, and even a three-year-old who has leukemia. We come today because we need you. We need a word of hope and encouragement that only you can provide. Many things transpire from Sunday to Sunday, but still, here we are, thankful and grateful that you have brought us through them all. So we come today to submit our will to your will, to surrender anything that will prevent, prevent us from seeing you today, we have come to see you, to feel you, and to hear you. Please make your presence known today through this service. We come standing on your promises with the belief that you are still God, still on the throne. You are still pulling the strings and calling the shots. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. And let us not leave this place the same way we have come. We pray this prayer in the name of your darling son, Jesus, who taught us that when we pray, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson today is 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 18, on page 989 in your pew Bibles. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks. be to God. tender 
the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord God, my strength and my redeemer. I have often wondered if Jesus knew what he was getting into when he first recruited Peter to become one of his followers. Peter had the honor of being chosen as one of the first disciples of Christ. As a matter of scriptural fact, Peter was not only the oldest, but he was the first one chosen. Jesus found Peter down by the seashore fishing for Peter was supposed to be a professional fisherman. But it turns out that when once asked by Jesus, how is the fishing? Sadly and shamefully, Peter's reply was, I have fished all night, but haven't caught a thing. What he was confessing was that he was a failure at the one thing that he was supposed to be good at. Now Jesus is telling him, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. As time went on, it looked like Jesus had made a mistake in choosing Peter. It looked like Peter was not going to work out or make the cut. Peter had issues, all kinds of personal issues. He had a bad attitude that caused him to be opinionated about almost everything and everybody. More than a few times, he was critical 
of the other disciples, even after Jesus had resurrected from the grave, Jesus told Peter personally, feed my sheep. Three times he told him that. Peter's reply is, yeah, okay, but what about John? What are you going to have him do? Peter had behavioral issues. He lacked self-control. Nobody knew what he would do next. He would leave the safety of a boat out in the middle of a raging sea just to see if he could walk on water and eventually began to sink when he took his eyes off Jesus. He carried a knife that he was not afraid to use. And on one occasion, he cut off a man's ear, causing Jesus a great deal of embarrassment, causing Jesus to have to restore the man's ear. Peter had mouth and tongue issues. <laughs> you never knew what was going to come out of his mouth. He had no self-control because he spoke before he thought. And was often heard saying the wrong things at the wrong time. Like the time he swore he would never ever leave Jesus, everybody else will, but not me. And then in the same breath, here he is denying Jesus three times. Peter made everything about himself, me, myself, and I. There were many things wrong with Peter. Just looked like Jesus had made a terrible mistake choosing Peter to be on his team. Just didn't look like Peter was going to work out. But here he is a few years later, Here's Peter writing a holy epistle. Here he is giving advice on how to be a mature Christian and telling you and telling me how to live 2,000 years later. And what does Peter have to tell us? He says to us, based on personal experience, personal mistakes, if you want to grow up in the faith like he did, grow in grace. Grow up in Jesus Christ. Who better? Who's better qualified to tell us what it means to grow in grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ than Peter? Peter is a perfect poster boy for growing in grace, growing in the Christian faith. But you know, I thank God for Peter because when I look at Peter and I consider all his issues and what God could do with him, I think that maybe, just maybe, God can do something with me and all my issues. See, Peter had some growing edges. Growing edges are those character flaws in our life that we need to work on, especially in our Christian walk. Now, I don't know about you, but I have some growing edges I've been working on for 73 years. I have character flaws. And if you don't believe me, Ask my wife. <laughs> Jesus never gave up on Peter. And he never gives up on you, and he never gives up on me. And by the grace of God, I'm still growing. I'm not what I used to be, but I'm a long way from what I need to be. How about you? You don't have to say amen. I'm still growing. I want to tell you this morning what it means to grow in grace. To grow in grace means eliminating those hindrances 
that prevent our spiritual growth. God wants to use us, and he can use us any way he pleases, but to be what he really wants us to be, we must gradually become what God wants us to be in grace. He wants us to be the best version of ourselves, the best me I can be. Growing in grace means removing the obstacles and barriers that stunt our growth in Christ. Growing in grace means growing in our prayer life, growing in our knowledge of the Bible, our stewardship, our Christian character. Growing in grace means we are actively working on our growing edges. It's a lifelong process. But here's where it starts. You got to first be aware that you have some growing edges. You got to move past denial. Paul calls this self-examination. In a few minutes, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And Paul tells us in Corinthians, let every person examine themselves. He says, before anyone takes the Lord's Supper, examine yourself. Since becoming a Christian, I've discovered that because I am saved does not mean that I am perfect. Growing in grace means I have some areas of my life I need to examine and work on. These are called growing edges. A growing edge is that area of your life that is underdeveloped and could hinder your spiritual growth as a child of God and prevent you from being all that God wants you to be. What we first need to know about growing edges is that we all have them. We do. Too many of us are in denial and we refuse to admit that we have issues. Just like Peter, some of us have some serious bad attitude issues. Amen, church. Some of us are critical about everything and everybody, especially in spiritual matters. Never read our Bibles, yet we think we are experts in everything spiritual. Problem is, we don't have the mind of Christ, as Paul calls it, and therefore our growth is stunted. The mind of Christ is not in us. Too many of us are operating with the mind of the world. We can't see things as God sees them. We are carnal and worldly, and Paul says, that spiritual things just don't make sense to us. So we have a critical attitude toward anything that gets in the way of us having our way. Some of us have behavioral issues. Uh, we have a, a carnal mind. We exhibit carnal and worldly behavior. We, we are still doing some of the same things we did before we got saved. There are some things, beloved, we should not be doing anymore. We are growing in grace. Because growing in grace means we are mindful of how we behave. We are imitators of Christ. Can people see Jesus in me? It's impossible to see something in us if it's not there. Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away and all things become new. Am I a new person or am I the same old man? Some of us have conversation issues. Are you aware that our mouth may be our problem? The reason people don't want to be around, some of us, not, not here, you know, them out there. <laughs> some of us just talk too much without anything meaningful to say. I hear some quiet amens in the background. <laughs> James says the tongue can be a destructive thing when we don't know how to control it. Our mouths tend to get us in trouble. 
We say the wrong thing at the wrong time. We use offensive language. We hurt people's feelings. We bark at people. I've been guilty of that. We gossip. Growing in grace means that I'm aware that I have growing edges. But here's the second thing. It took me a long time to understand this process. Growing in grace means that I have a plan to correct my growing edges. It's not enough to know you got them. What are you going to do about them? What is your plan to address and correct your growing edges? Here is what Peter said he did and tells us what we ought to do. Peter says, grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you plan to improve your attitude, your behavior, and your language, and if it does not include Jesus, you are wasting your time and really don't have a plan because, uh, you know, I'll be critical of these authors, but these self-help books, they, they just don't work. There is a hymn we sing that states, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Another verse that says, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. I want to be more loving in my heart. Growing in Jesus means in my heart. It's a heart thing. Mind and heart have to be connected. You just can't say it. You got to do it. You got to practice it. It takes work. And outside of Jesus, you will never grow in grace. One of the purposes is discipleship. That's what we call ourselves here. We are the disciples of Christ. It means that I'm striving to be like Jesus at home, at work, at church, in my attitude, in my behavior, in my language, in my prayer life, in my giving, in my stewardship. We should want to be the best person we can be. Best husband, best wife, best choir member, best trustee, best elder, best deacon, best minister, best pastor. Before we act, ask your question. We used to, when this was popular way back in the day, when we used to say, what would Jesus do? Before you speak, what would Jesus say? But here's the third thing, final thing about growing in grace after you aware that you have them, you get a plan. How do I know that I have grown? Well, see, it's kind of an unusual thing that other people know it before you do because they can see. Other people notice the change in you. You're not as quick-tempered. You're not as impatient as you used to be. They see that you are more tolerant, more patient, more loving, more long-suffering. Grace grows in us gradually. That's why it's called fruit, fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit makes us sweet. The fruits of the Spirit makes us more like Jesus as we grow. When a baby is born, you can't always tell what he or she is going to look like. You think you, you can at birth, but you really can't. You can't know what they will become until they grow. If they don't grow, there's some problems somewhere. And the older they get, the more they look like mama, they look like dad, they behave like their parents. It takes time. It, it doesn't happen overnight. It's like refining gold. Parents have to work at it. It's hard work. You all know it's hard work raising children. <laughs> Guess what God's got to put up with with us? I told you the story, and some of you already know it, so just pretend this is the first time you've ever heard it. It's about a refiner who refines gold, and, and he, he smelts down the gold to get all the impurities and all of the defects and faults of the gold off of it. He puts it in the furnace and he turns the furnace up and he burns it and he burns it and he burns it till he burns off everything unnecessary. 
Someone asked, well, how will you know when it's, when, it, when it's ready? Because if you keep it in there too long, you'll burn it up. If you don't keep it in there long enough, nothing will happen. And we finally said, well, I can look in there and I can see my reflection. When I can see my reflection, I know I'm there. When God can see his son in us, that's when you know that you have grown. To grow in grace means that it becomes necessary for Jesus. Keep us in the fire sometimes of life. Burn off the growing edges. If we don't stay in the, the fire long enough, we will not grow. But if we stay in the fire too long, it will destroy us. Jesus knows when he can look in the furnace and look in the storms and we look like him we talk like him, we behave like him. He knows that he has accomplished his purpose. And now that I look at Peter, I thank God for Peter. I thank God that he doesn't pick and choose perfect folk. Now, he, wouldn't have, he, he would have passed me by. God looks at defective folk. God looks at folk who have some kind of potential, who's willing to be changed and God will change them if they are willing to grow. Am I more like Jesus? I'm asking me, not you. Am I more loving? Am I more kind? Am I more tolerant? And Lord knows I've been shopping for patience a long time. Father, thank you that you put up with us all our mess, all our foolishness, you tolerate us. But when you look at us, you don't see grown folk, you see babes, you see children, you see people that you love and you embrace. And when you see us, you laugh. You laugh, Lord, when you see us. And we thank God that you have chosen us as your children and you are our Father. Lord, help us grow, but help us grow in grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Whenever I get to this part of the service, I struggle more than any other time trying to figure out what I want to say. But I do know that we are gathered around this beautiful altar, three points, and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And we are asked to take a tiny piece of bread and a sip of drink. And that is important to us. But you know, that is Jesus' body. And it is his blood. And we make it a part of us. And if we make it a part of us, aren't we better people? If we make it a part of us, we're a better church together. All are welcome here. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples in the upper room, and they were having the last supper. And he took the bread, and he broke it, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do so in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the cup and he poured it out to his disciples and said, This is my blood given for you. Drink of it and do so in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. Come by the outside aisle and return by the inside aisle. And if you cannot come to the table, stay where you are and we will find you. Please come.
Join with me in prayer, please. Father in heaven, you are in our midst. You are all around us. We present these offerings to you from grateful hearts. We pledge to use them in making this place a better place to live and to love. Help us to always be faithful, to be generous in all that we do. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you have been here with us and you think this might be a great place for you to worship, we would invite you to come forward and become a part of us. Seeing then, hear this benediction. This is from Psalm 85, and it says, Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. And as we go forth today, may we go in love, in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in peace. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. Hardy. Thank you, Danny.